Last time we spoke, you weren't as defensive as you are now. What's changed? So I would say, Don, it's not that we're overly defensive. It's that, you know, while some people have said, okay, we've created a tremendous amount of value in the market at this point, and perhaps it's not now a time to step in, I think we're more in wait and see mode. You know, we de-risked in our portfolio uh, earlier this year. We're sitting on very high levels of cash relative to history. And as much as I want to jump in when I see some of these companies de-rate as much as they have, and I think we're getting closer to peak hoggishness when it comes to the Fed, you know, I'm still remaining a little bit cautious about adding a lot of incremental risk in the near term. I'm struggling, I think, like a lot of investors, to come up with powerful catalysts, aside from some technical and sort of sentiment pops, to lead to more sustained rally in the equity market. Okay, let's talk about how to play defense then, because the defensive part of this equity market, there was a real bias there over the last few months, and then even the defensive names got caught up in some of this as well. So help us understand how best to play defense in a world that we're in at the moment. Yeah, John, I think there's been a bit of lazy uh, investing happening over recent months. In particular, people are looking at a defensive playbook, like perhaps to say, you know, they want to invest in staples or utilities, as Taylor was just discussing. Um, but those are not necessarily companies, I think, that are going to be able to meaningfully maintain their margins or even grow earnings through a slower economic growth uh, cycle. And so we actually think defensive means looking at quality companies who have a little bit more of a kind of a Teflon earnings stream. Believe it or not, for you know, a lot of that is in technology. There's some parts of consumer where brands or services are unlikely to be uh, sort of, uh, you're not going to see diminished demand for them, uh, even if economic growth slows and the Fed really manages to slow down the overall economy. So I think it's more than just looking at sectors. It's looking at companies. It's looking at business models. Uh, and it's looking about really where the future of demand is, uh, not just what you kind of the playbook we've had in the past of defense of sectors or industries. Okay, let's talk about where that demand is, where it has been and how it's changing. As an economist, you might be looking at the rotation of consumer spending away from goods and towards services. Is that an equity story for you too? Yeah, it is a story. I mean, I think a lot of that has started to play out already in price action, by the way. Uh, we've known that this transition from goods to services was going to happen as soon as the U.S. and global economy opened up in, in more meaningful size. But even within services, I mean, some of those services have meaningful pricing power. Uh, some of them have pricing power that's enduring, as in not just a snapback uh, to activities that people had to pull back on during the pandemic and when there were shutdowns. Um, and so, again, it, this is going to be more like company by company uh, and sometimes industry uh, exposure as opposed to just saying I'm rotating wholesale into services. A moment ago you played uh, that clip from Katie Koch at, at, at Goldman Sachs and I think that's completely spot on. This is going to be a more challenging aggregate returns environment and you have to be more agile and you have to get deeper into specific stories. You're seeing this really play out as companies have reported earnings over the course of the last few weeks. It's not just good enough to have had okay results or solid results that maybe beat and uh, consensus expectations for the first quarter, but companies have to offer up guidance and give you know a level of assurance to investors that they have uh, earnings power in coming quarters. How many companies are actually able to offer guidance at the moment, Kate? Oh gosh, yeah, that uh, you're just you have to catch me on that one. You're right because fewer and fewer companies are offering up guidance than they have historically. One bit of data I was looking at earlier this morning was actually the number of companies that have reduced guidance relative to. Um, you know, raise guidance or maintain their previous guidance. You know, that's come down, but we're talking about a pretty small pool relative to history. Look, if you're a corporate management team, there's not a huge amount of incentive to put, you know, big, uh, far-reaching numbers out there. Um, the penalty for missing is pretty significant. So it's not so much just about the earnings numbers, but it's about, like, sort of the direction of travel for their businesses that we're paying attention to. Missing the rally on crude, there's been a big penalty for that. Energy wow. names on the S&P up 44%. And just going through your notes, Kate, some of the calls from you and the team, this is a part of the market that you still like, the energy patch. Why is that? Yeah, I mean... We liked energy before uh, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, by the way, and a lot of that had to do with a supply discipline, frankly, uh, in the sector. And, you know, that capex and supply and spending discipline we think is going to persist, even if on the margin we see a little bit more production out of other parts of the world, um, given in the situation with Russia. 
That said, it's possible in some parts of the commodity complex, even though we remain really constructive, we see a slightly weaker demand environment over the course of the next few months than we saw over the past uh, couple months. I think that would be an opportunity to add in more commodity and resource exposure um, for the medium term. So we're looking at any weakness, like we've seen a little bit in copper um, and some other base materials, as an opportunity to add uh, for a more medium term view. So Kate, am I doing that in the US or through the European names? These are global names, right? Commodities are a global market. Uh, so some of the U.S. materials names have a little bit more sort of chemical uh, bias to them. The global miners are listed, you know, more often in London and in Europe than the rest of the world. Um, and then there are really specific names, actually interesting names in parts of the emerging world, I think, that can add to your resource basket. Are you comfortable with the beta to Chinese growth associated with some of those names? Yeah, some of those names have had, as you point out, incredible beta to Chinese growth historically. Uh, that said, we think there's broad-based demand, both from construction and overall industrial activity, that will support, combined with relatively lower inventories than we've seen in history, and com com combined with not just a supply discipline we saw in the energy sector, but across a lot of the miners. So look, it's a, it's a pretty good story. If China completely collapses, of course, we're going to see a massive sentiment hit to a lot of these names. Yeah. That is not our base case at this point and certainly uh, does not work in uh, Xi's uh, favor going into the fall party meetings.